Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another Manfrotto School of Excellence webinar. Um, today, I'm delighted to say we've got uh, Victoria Hillman with us, and she'll be doing a webinar on spiders to safakas, how to capture unique wildlife images. Uh, just to just to say, if you drop from the webinar due to the the connection, uh, be assured we we record the webinar, and you'll be able to log in to the Manfrotto School of Excellence website and listen to the archive recording. Uh, with you today we, is myself, Kevin Price, and William Bacassi. Uh, a little bit about the Manfrotto School of Excellence. It's an online imaging educational resource brought to you by some of the best professionals of the imaging world, including Bill Frakes, Joe McNally, Drew Gardner, Michael Freeman, Victoria Hillman, of course, Phil Coates, Pete Bridgewood, and Roberto Bagano, and Jacob James. Um, the school is supported by some of the, um, the best accessory brands in the market, including Manfrotto, Gitso, Kata, National Geographic Bags, Last Light, and Avenger. We really welcome your questions today. And uh, as Victoria goes through her talk, um, you can post your questions to us in the tab uh, on the slide there. And we'll, we'll, we'll take the questions, and we'll pass them over to uh, Victoria at, at, the, at some good times during the talk. And she can, she can answer your questions. A little bit about uh, Victoria. Uh, she's an award-winning wildlife and nature photographer. I recently won two top awards at the Zoological Society of London Animal Photography Prize Awards. And the winning images are currently on exhibition at London Zoo until the end of the year. In fact, she tells me she's the only female adult winner to win a prize. Favorite camera and lens, Canon 7D and Canon 100mm. Uh, favorite tripod kit is a Manfrotto 390 series tripod, which you can see more of on the manfrotto.co.uk site. She, she enjoys creating thought-provoking and artistic images of wildlife and nature to convey its beauty and also a sense of place. You can find out more about that and, and Victoria's uh, latest projects on her website, uh, vixpix.com. In terms of product testimonium, uh, Victoria says a Cata Elements cover goes everywhere with me as, as it allows me to continue shooting in any environment and weather conditions knowing that my equipment will be well protected against whatever the weather throws at me, which is crucial for my photography as I always work in the field. Uh, you can have a look more about Cata products on catabags.co.uk. Now over to the good stuff, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll pass you over to Victoria for the rest of the webinar, and please uh, fire over your questions to us. Enjoy the webinar. I can see your first slide there, Victoria. Yeah. Yeah. Will, okay. Will well, you. hello and welcome to my first webinar for the Manfrotto School of Excellence called From Spiders to Savakas, How to Capture Unique Wildlife Images. During this webinar, I will take you on a wildlife journey starting with invertebrates, moving on to reptiles, birds, and finally mammals, covering a range of techniques for capturing different and distinctive images. I will look at the use of close-ups and showing the subject in its habitat using both color and monochrome and how to bring out the best in your subject and why sometimes removing the color can create a more remarkable image. Towards the end of the webinar, I will discuss using silhouettes to produce striking images and how to overcome practical obst obstacles of working in the field in different locations. Many of the images you will see have been created completely in camera with only minimal, if any, post-processing carried out. If you do have any questions, uh, please do send them through, and hopefully you'll take away some tips and tricks to try out and be inspired to get out and about. So wildlife photography is a vast area with literally millions of images out there, encompassing numerous subjects, techniques, and endless possibilities for capturing different images. As a result, it can be a real challenge to come up with new ideas that haven't already been explored, but it is a challenge that can be both fun and rewarding. I'm not actually a photographer by training, I'm a zoologist and wildlife biologist, with photography being an interest that has grown alongside my studies. But these two subjects actually work very well together, as by studying my subject, its behaviours and interactions with its habitat, I'm able to gain a greater understanding of its daily life and consequently capture some very special moments on camera. As far as possible, I will only use natural light and only really use a flash for night work or to create a special effect. 
to start with spiders. And this first image is of a common garden spider sitting in her web, suspended from an old plant head. You'll hear many people say that the best light is around sunrise and sunset, and to a degree they're right. I took this image just as the sun was rising, which gives a warm glow to the overall image, but helps to pick out the transparency of the spider's legs, as well as her web. To achieve the composition I wanted, I had to get below the subject and almost shoot upwards and slightly into the rising sun to darken the plant whilst allowing the light to shine through the legs of the spider. By shooting your subject upwards from below, you can produce some great images, as long as you don't mind occasionally getting dirty and wet. So this next image is again of spiders, but these are long-jawed orb web spiders, a species that is found in most gardens within the UK. I've taken a different approach to this image and used black and white with high contrast to pick out the two male spiders whilst darkening the background and producing a rather eerie image. The two male spiders were vying for the attention of a female spider on whose web I found them. I watched them for some time, plucking at the individual silk strands and finally came up with the idea of showing them both, but with one in focus in the foreground and the second out of focus in the background. This is one occasion where midday light works very well as I used it to highlight the spiders and parts of the web, allowing this high contrast image to work. This species is fantastic in terms of allowing for creative shots, as their bodies and legs are such the light will shine almost straight through them, giving them a glow, which I've used to the full here. The spiders are one species that stir up strong feelings, often negative ones, but they have complicating and intriguing lives that unwind before us that we never see, and for this reason I wanted to include a couple of images that will hopefully allow them to be seen in a different light. Now for anyone out there that really doesn't like spiders, these are the only two images I've included here, so I'll now move on to other insects. So here we have a simple image of a green nettle weevil in its habitat. I say simple, as it's a simple image with not too much going on, but it was a real challenge to capture and focus. A lot of insect photography involves close-ups, either of the whole subject or just part of it, but very rarely do you see the insect in its habitat, which is a surprise as they're fundamental to all ecosystems. Not only that, but a great subject to work with. They can, however, be tricky subjects as well, as firstly, you have to find them. And like this weevil, many of them certainly in the UK are small, being less than a few centimetres. And when you do find them, they're often hidden in the undergrowth. I was lucky to find this weevil walking around quite high up on the ferns with minimal background to worry about. Some people say that your main subject should be in the middle of the picture, but I don't always agree. I opted to have the weevil slightly to one side on the fern front, giving enough space to have a second out of focus front in the background to give a real sense of place of the small weevil in a big habitat, and I used a wide aperture to create a shallow depth of field to really make the weevil stand out. So we have another weevil here. Again, in its habitat, but this time on a flower. Now, for this image, I wanted to show a different relationship, the one between just the weevil and the flower on which it lives. So again, I've used a wide aperture to blur out everything in the background, allowing for the main flower and weevil to stand out. It was quite a breezy day when I took this, but this actually added to the image by giving a sense of movement to the grass in the background with the flower and the weevil frozen in the foreground. Both these images, and indeed, with many of the subjects you'll see here, despite having been taken on bright sunny days, I've used a cloudy white balance, along with slightly underexposing the images to really bring out the colours and vibrancy. So on to zoom, it was a bit of fun, and I took several attempts to get the saw fly in focus for this one. As with the majority of my insect work, I will always take identification shots first before heading on to more creative work. I came across this saw fly in the grass next to a river, and as I took the identification shots, it started making its way up the grass towards the camera. As it perched on the end of the grass, I moved closer to see if I could get a head-on shot, which is, when, which is when it took one leg off the grass and started to almost wave it. This is one of the few shots where I have used a flash, and I must say at this point, if I am using a flash, I do tend to use a diffuser and never point it directly at the subject and I've actually used it just to create a little bit more light in a dark situation. Again, here I've used a wide aperture to throw out the background and to make the eyes and the front leg stand out, and taken it in portrait orientation to fit in with the long body of the saw fly. And if you look closely, you can even make out a tiny water droplet hanging from that front leg. A quick tip for you. 
Photographing insects in the field can present itself with several challenges. Once you've found your subject, for those that crawl along the ground, you cannot use a tripod as you are not able to get right down to their level. And if the foliage is very dense, you could end up causing quite a bit of damage. So what I use and can recommend is a bean bag. And if it's particularly wet, pop it in a plastic bag. For subjects found higher up, I would suggest using a tripod as this gives you greater stability and also a chance to take a step back to see if you're shooting at the angle that you actually want. I'm do a mayfly here. Now this is a newly emerged mayfly and it was drying out before it takes to the wing. Now these insects belong to an ancient group of insects which includes damselflies and dragonflies which we'll see shortly. This particular individual had just emerged and it was allowing its wings to dry out before taking to the air. The water it's on was very still and this created a beautiful reflection. To capture the detail of the insects, I used an aperture of 5.6 along with a flash to help bring out the colours in the wings. However, because I used the flash, I did have to underexpose it quite a bit from, to stop the uh, fly from being completely blown out. Now here we have a damsel fly, slightly different take on a damsel fly and it was actually a very tricky image to take as they don't tend to sit still very long especially as the day warms up when they start to take to the wing but on this particular day it was also quite windy so when they did settle they were blow being blown in and out of focus I found this one damsel fly that was sitting tight right on the end of a blade of grass no matter what so crawling in below the level of the damsel fly as I found these are less likely to take to the wing if you come in at their level or below I set up my camera on the tripod at the right height and then manually focused on the point that the damselfly would come into focus as it was blown across the lens. It took several t attempts to get it right, but eventually I got there and the background was naturally blurred out by all the grass blowing around behind it. And what I wanted to achieve here was to give a real impression of the damselfly coming out of the grass, creating a stri striking contrast between the blue and the green. We have another image of a damsel fly, but a slightly different one, and I wanted a minimalistic, soft image. If you want to photograph these insects, it really does help to get up very early in the morning before they start flying around too much. Now, with this particular image, I use the grassy habitat as a soft backdrop from which the damsel fly is emerging on a single blade of grass. Using an aperture again of 5.6, that will give just enough detail to the wing without being completely in focus and opted to position it to the side of the frame with it peering into the centre of the image. So we're going to move on to their bigger cousins now. Now this is actually a dragonfly and I took this very late on in the season when the leaves were already turning with the onset of autumn. Now the up and down weather that we've been has, experiencing has really confused the dragonflies and unfortunately this one had emerged but not fully dried out before a storm hit, slodging it from its grass stem and into the water. The reason I've included this image is to show that sometimes there can be real beauty even in death, and this image really illustrates that and how the crazy weather has been affecting many species. This dragonfly looked so peaceful, suspended on the surface of the water, complete with reflection, and the beautiful colours of the autumn leaves. Natural death is a part of any species life cycle. So all I would say is don't always overlook something that at first glance may seem a bit morbid. It may well surprise you with a beautiful, peaceful, yet striking image. To enhance this image further, I actually took it in an angle rather than horizontally. So this image um, of insects actually shows a butterfly, but in a very different way to the normal close-up and detailed image that you tend to see. I wasn't really sure if shooting the butterfly from a distance with so much background was going to work. But trial and error are huge, a huge parts of photography, allowing you to grow as a photographer and also to explore new creative ideas. I used quite a shallow depth of field to throw out the branches in the background that were gently swaying in the breeze that have created this lovely blurred effect, whilst really picking out the butterfly sitting on that lone branch. I could crop the image for a closer view of the butterfly, but I find that it's good to stay, take a step back occasionally. So, we're actually going to move away from insects now. Just a, just a few questions on, on, on that section reptiles. of your talk, uh, Victoria. So, we've got, uh, we've got a question from Tim. 
And he says, do you pre-focus on, on the area or do you wait for the insect? It's a bit of both actually. With the, the damselfly coming out of the grass, the one that was actually manually focused, I focused on the position that I knew it was going to come into focus as it blew across the lens. Now with others, um, I will actually focus particularly on the subject when it's there and I see it. Okay, fantastic. And we've got another good question from Paul. And uh, it says, Victoria, do you ever use focus stacking software? No. Everything okay. you see here is done in camera. Yeah, you did say you did say that at the start of the yeah. um, webinar. And then we've got uh, Stefano. Stefano asks, uh, use, use only 100 mil macro for the pictures, and are they cropped at all? None of the images um, are cropped, no. Uh, but for the butterfly image, I've actually used a 100 to 400 mil zoom lens. Okay, fantastic. And Gautam asks, how close are you, you know, to the subjects when you're taking when you're taking these uh, these images? For the close-up images using my macro lens, I'm about yeah. 30 to 40 centimeters away, and with the zoom lens, much further away than that. Okay, and uh, just uh, just a uh, Robert says he's he's uh, he's con he's just connected from Ireland and he says hello. So, uh, but moving on, yeah. that's the that's <laughs> the questions on insects, and uh, I think you, you you're moving on to reptiles now. If I'm not not mistaken, yeah. I am yes, reptiles and snakes. Fantastic. So I apologise if anyone doesn't like snakes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave you to that, yeah. Okay, so this first one is of a strange creature called a mossy leaf-tailed gecko. Now these geckos are perfectly camouflaged, laying almost flat against the tree trunk, and the frilled ed edges to their skin actually break, help to break up their outline. Now it's completely by chance I spotted this particular gecko when I turned around to look back and noticed a lump on a tree and decided that I should take a closer look and was delighted to find that it was the gecko that I was hoping to see. To start with, I took a couple of shots from a distance to show the camouflage, then had to think about the best way to capture the frills and the huge eyes. So I decided to take this image looking up the tree from below with the camera flat against the trunk which really helps the eyes to stand out and giving the appearance of a huge smile whilst the front limbs look like they are hugging the tree. I've used an aperture of 5.6 here so the eyes will be almost coming out of the image whilst also providing enough definition to the body to add depth to the image. The main focus point is on, is on the eyes and I've used a flash due to the darkness of it being in a rainforest but still used a cloudy white balance to add warmth and underexpose slightly to really bring out the colours. Now a good tip for when working outdoors, um, particularly if you're in the rainforest, is the, is the weather can change very quickly and without warning. So it's always a good idea to carry some form of weather covers with you for your camera. Um, I always carry a set of uh, elements covers from Kata and the extens extension sleeve because they fold up really small and can be carried in your bag and provide fantastic protection. Now I, I've actually even used them on boats to protect against salt spray. Now they're quick and easy to put on and it means you can continue shooting in any conditions as long as you remember to wrap yourself up too. And if you're concerned about any noise that may disturb the wildlife, they're actually wonderfully quiet and I now never leave home without them. So we're actually going to move on to a couple of images of the ends now. And this first one is quite an unusual image of a dual chameleon. Chameleons are famous for their colours, but often their wonderfully textured skin is overlooked as a result. If you remove the colour, you notice the skin and the eyes that are actually perfect for creating really moody images. Now, I found this particular image, this particular individual coming up through a thorn bush in very bright sunlight, conditions that I would normally avoid due to the high contrast levels they can produce. But on this occasion, the high contrast levels were perfect for a moody black and white image using the conditions to create a dark background out of which the chameleon is carefully picking its way through the lighter thorns. I took several shots as it's made its way upwards through the thorns, but I picked this one due to the front leg coming forward, giving the impression that the chameleon was really coming out of the image. I've used an aperture of 3.5 here to really throw out the background and darken the shadows slightly and up the contrast. And this actually still remains one of my favourite images I've 
ever taken and has really reignited my passion for black and white photography. Now this was taken at night using a flash with a diffuser to, diffuser to add more light and actually using a torch like behind the chameleon shining through the foliage which is creating that green glow you can see just behind its head. The chameleon itself is a baby short-nosed chameleon hanging from the end of a leaf, a behavior that is typically seen at night where it can feel any vibrations that may be caused by a predator. Now nighttime is by far the best time to find chameleons in Madagascar and this baby was out in the open allowing for a different and more creative image and it illustrates that by setting up lights in the right place you can get a really good shot without disturbing the subject. As far as this particular image goes, even though I've taken it at night, I've actually only used an ISO of 320, but I have horrendously underexposed it to completely isolate the chameleon in the green glow against the dark background to create a very striking image. This, this is a chameleon here. It's actually called an Oosterlitz chameleon. It's taken on a very cloudy day and from bo below looking upwards to avoid the branches of the tree. The reason I've included this image is to really illustrate how by removing the color from the image brings out the texture. Because the eye is not distracted by the bright colors, you start to focus on other aspects of the photo, which in this case is the skin texture. It also shows if you can isolate your subject against the sky, there is no, no distraction from the background. We often look at bringing out the colors of wildlife and producing beautiful image, images that are eye-catching through the warmth or brightness of the colors. But you can create an eye-catching image just by using simple black and white. And I hope that by showing you images like this one, you may have more confidence to remove color from your images in the future. Now, I've got a couple of snake images uh, for you here. So again, I do apologize if you don't like snakes. But my trip to Madagascar was the first time I really had the opportunity to photograph snakes, and certainly the first time in the wild. So I was delighted when we came across a big-eyed grass snake which is what you can see here. Now, the name might suggest it's quite a big snake, but it's actually tiny and it's really quite a bit smaller than the grass snakes that we get in the UK. Although I'd never photographed wild snakes prior to going to Madagascar, I knew that the best images would come from getting right down to eye level. And even at the time I didn't know what species this was, I was aware that snakes found in Madagascar are not really venomous to humans. And to sh the shock of all the people around me, I actually dropped flat to the ground. I positioned myself far enough away from the snake to give it room to come towards me through the leaf litter, which really helped to create this image. I used an aperture of f7 here to get the end of the nose and the eye in focus while still blurring out the background, using the closest eye to focus on. More and more I find myself now positioning my subject to one side of the frame. And in this case, it's to the left as you look at it, with the snake coming forward and into the frame itself. This is a lot of my reptile images. We have another snake here. And it's actually the, a close-up of a Madagascan tree boa. Now, it's actually taken at night using the flash. And if you are taking photos at night, I find it much easier to have someone with you that can use a torch, light, torch to lighten up your subject as in this case, although the vehicle lights did help as well as this snake was actually crossing the road. Now to capture the movement of the tongue, I opted for a slower shutter speed than I would normally use at night, and you can see this has resulted in the shadow of the tongue as the snake flicks it upwards, and you can also see a water droplet just hanging from underneath its bottom jaw. I think that's the is that the end of the reptile that's section. That's the end of the reptiles, yeah. Got some uh, great questions that have come in. Uh, firstly, just a, a compliment, which is coming from uh, Mr. Braithwaite. It says, just fantastic image of the chameleon in black and white. Fan you know, well done for that. Um, Ruth asks, what kind of flash setup do you use? Um, I just have a standard Canon speed light that goes on top of my camera. But I have something called an omnibounce box that I actually pop on the front of it. And this completely softens and diffuses all the light that comes out from the flash. Great stuff. And um, Robert, uh, he, he joined the webinar a little bit later than anticipated. So he's just um, he's very keen to know what, what lens and camera 
you, you're generally using for some of the shots that you've gone through? Um, certainly with all of the reptiles and the insects, they're pretty much all taken on a Canon 7D and the majority of them with a 100mm macro lens, including the snake that you can currently see. And um, what? And Rob is also asking what uh, what do you have in? I think in in the bag. I mean, in in your you know what sort of equipment you carry in your camera bag. I think it's particularly meaning. Um, normally carry a couple of camera bodies and a whole variety of lenses. So I'll have a macro lens. Um, I've got a 100 to 400 zoom lens, an 18 to 270 lens as well. Um, and also an 18 to 55 lens, along with extension tubes, my flash, and numerous replacement batteries and memory cards. Okay. And David asks a very good question. He says, when is it acceptable to use flash in wildlife photography and when not? I would say if you think you're going to cause a disturbance to your subject by using flash, don't use it. Mm -hmm. um, generally, I found that if you don't point your flash directly at the subject, they tend not to react to it. Um, certainly with the reptiles, there was no reaction to the flash at all. Um, insects tend not to react to it. It's more when you get up to the mammals that I would suggest probably not using it. Um, we've got a question about uh, apps as well, uh, whether you use any apps for in your black and white photography. Nope, again, all that is done in camera. Okay, great stuff. And a couple of questions about equipment. Um, uh, I think I'm right in saying you, you use cutter element covers, which we which mentioned at the start of the, the webinar. And, and if you want to get more information about cutter in terms of the cutter bags or cutter element covers, then you can you can have a look at the uh, the cutter UK website, which is cutterbags.co.uk. Okay, I think we can we can move on to the next section of the webinar, which is is uh, covering birds. Yeah. Great stuff. Okay, so no, I'm actually not a big fan of photographing birds. But when I do, I'll normally pick one or two subjects and just concentrate on them. Now, the next three images I'm going to show you are actually all of the same bird. It's a male white-throated dipper. And I've actually picked these three images to illustrate how important it is to not only know and study your subject to capture beautiful moments, how by spending a large percentage of time focusing on one subject can really pay off. And this goes for any subject, not just birds. Now, I'm actually lucky that I've had good access to this particular individual. And these three images were taken over a period of seven months, during which time the bird became accustomed to my presence to the point he would go about his daily life around me um, and just allow me into that routine. Now, dippers are actually known for being very skittish little birds and can be very difficult to photograph. But by establishing boundaries around which he was comfortable and not stressed out by my presence, I've managed to capture moments that many people don't even see. And this first image actually shows him looking for insect larva under rocks by putting his head into the flow of the river whilst gripping tightly to the rock. Now, through the spring months, when insect larvae are at their most abundant in the river, he would spend a great proportion of his day actually feeding like this, rarely sitting still. And you can actually see how the water just flows straight over his head there. Next is actually a rare moment of calm in his busy life on the river. Dippers do stop periodically to preen and keep their feathers tidy, which is incredibly important, as this allows them to um, swim in the river and go about hunting for all the insect larva under the rocks. Now, this particular image was taken in the morning, as I found this to be the best time to catch him sitting still long enough to get some shots. Now, during my time photographing this dipper, I wanted to capture all aspects of his life on the stream, creating a story of images. And this is the calm, peaceful moment, with the river still flowing behind him, giving a, a sense of place. But again, I've composed the shot with the main subject to one side, and in this case, to the corner to give a size perspective of the little bird against the big river behind. Now, as with all this, the level rises and falls with rainfall, and this was taken when the river was at its lowest point this year. This was great for the dipper, as it meant getting the insect larva was so much easier, but it also meant the river wasn't flowing as fast, and this was a lucky shot I managed to grab just as he poked his head up from behind the moss-covered rock, giving just enough of a reflection, but I had to be very quick. 
And this actually shows the importance of spending time with one subject, getting to know its behaviours and patterns, as it allows you to be ready to grab shots like this one. Now, I mainly concentrate on a couple of main subjects a year, which then actually allows me to create a photographic diary of that animal's life. So we're going to leave the dippers behind now. This is a slightly more creative image, and I hope you can actually make out what it is. It's actually an owl sitting in a tree. Normally when I head out, I don't really have any ideas of the images that I want to take. I generally just go with the moment and conditions and see what happens. This one is different, as I actually had this idea in my head, should I be lucky enough to see the owl before I even left the UK for Madagascar. I wanted this half and half image showing just half of the Scots owl between the, heart, between the spiny tree trunks. I can honestly say, had it not been for the guys we were with, I would never have seen it. As you can see, the camouflage is incredible, and this is what I wanted to really illustrate with this particular image. Now we're going to move to my boy moment here, and this is actually a pied kingfisher. It's a beautiful bird that lends itself very well to black and white. Now this was actually taken from a hide, which was not only very dark inside compared to the bright sun outside, but also cast a shadow over the lake in which the kingfisher was perched on a dead tree. I tried several attempts with different settings to get a decent colour shot, but in the end decided to use black and white, and overexpose the image to white out the background completely, whilst keeping all the detail in the wood and the kingfisher. In terms of composition, I moved into a position where I could have the branch coming into the shot from the bottom corner, pointing diagonally upwards to the top corner, with a bird perched right on the end, looking down into the water. And you can actually see the sun just reflecting in his eye there. Now, I've got a couple of swan images coming. Uh, uh, the image is what I call my marmite image, because people seem to love it or hate it, and some people just struggle to make out what it is. Now, it is actually an adult mute swan, and it's actually preening its feathers. Now, the majority of people have a preconceived ideas of what different animals or birds should look like when they're photographed. But this leads to hundreds, if not thousands, of similar images flooding the internet and books. I don't think I've ever taken a standard swan image, as I always look for something that will make people think. When I actually took this image, as the swan was having a good preen on a cold winter's day, and it was just lifting its head out from underneath its wing, producing one of the most peaceful images I think I've ever seen, and one that I desperately wanted to capture. I actually used the also white balance setting on this one to add a coolness to the images. So the whites would stand out less, allowing the orange and black of the head to come to prominence, whilst preserving the details on the feathers. Now, interestingly, a few years ago, I actually had this in, a, in an exhibition as an A1 canvas. And someone actually told me that the image was all wrong, as it was too white, the orange was too bright, and it was too artistic. But I think this actually helped spur me on and down the path of more artistic wildlife photography. And the one thing I will say is don't be afraid to try new things. Not everyone will like them, and you will get criticised. But if you can create something that no one else can to show, show the beauty of nature, then I definitely suggest going for it. So now there's this one here. But this is actually a juvenile mute swan, with all the lovely shades of brown in its feathers. Now, swans must be one of the most photographed birds within the UK, but the majority are of similar composition with the swan either side or face on. So I went for something different here and took the image from behind and slightly to the side of the bird, almost looking over its shoulder. It had just finished having a good wash and was mid-preen when it lifted its head, looking out over the water, creating this wonderfully calm image. I chose to fill the bottom right corner uh, with the top of the swan's body and head, complete with the tiny water droplet sitting on its feathers, leaving around two-thirds of the image to be filled with a slightly out of focus, smooth water behind. And the focus point is actually on the eye, and I've under, underexposed it slightly just to add a bit more moodiness to the image. Now, a quick tip with wildlife photography, be it birds, insects, or mammals, you want to create memorable images. So I would suggest having a look to see what images are out there first, and then try to capture something unique and fresh. Try spending a day with one particular subject, trying out different settings, color, monochrome, even the white balance, and move around if possible, but remember not to cause any disturbance to your subject, looking for different angles. Images don't always have to be taken face on, and you don't always have to see the eyes of your subject, as I will show you later on. Now, this is my bird images. 
and it is a penguin taken on the beaches in South Africa. Now, penguins are funny little birds that lend themselves very nicely to a variety of different possibilities. This particular individual, as I said, was taken on the beach in South Africa, and I wanted to show the small penguin on a vast expanse of beach, and achieved this by composing the shot with the penguin in the bottom corner, coming towards me with its head turned into the shot, with a big area of beach behind. Now, wildlife photography is not just about capturing stunning images of animals close up or particular behavior, behaviors, it's also about showing them in their habitat and the relationship they have with it. Now, as you'll see with many of my images, I tend to use a middle ground between the close-ups and the in-habitat, showing off aspects of where I photograph my subject, as I've done here. But I actually also opted for black and white here to really make the penguin stand out with its beautiful black and white markings against the white of the sand. Yeah, fantastic image, uh, Victoria. Um, some more questions on the, this section on, of the webinar on birds. So we've got uh, Nigel asking, do you ever use bracketing? Uh, no, not so far. Um, okay, and uh, we've got um, a question from Ruth again. She she asks, uh, you shoot black and white in camera. You've already yeah you said mostly in camera, but and she says, but she wonders if you do any post processing like sharpening or enhancing exposure or color. So not for black um, and white, but gen generally yeah. Generally no. Um, really, the only post processing work I tend to do is actually when it comes to printing the images um, because when you print onto different mediums to get the same end result you do need to tweak a few bits and pieces but um, generally speaking I try to do everything in camera while I'm in the field. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rand Randall says uh, I'd like to compliment Victoria on a choice of perspective. Most, most, most uh, photographer shooters are afraid of getting dirty so kudos to her. That's another, <laughs> another good compliment. Um, Greg's asking, I assume from Victoria's comment about white balance that she shoots JPEG rather than uh, RAW, can, 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 you, can she say why? Uh, I actually always shoot in RAW. I've, I don't shoot in JPEG at all. And, and there's a, she was just wondering if there's a reason for that. Um, it quite, does, quite it a lot does. Of people asking that to us. It, it does actually give you um, more flexibility if you do want to carry out any post-processing with your images. Um, and with the black and white chameleon that I showed earlier, that one was actually converted to black and white when I got home because I had literally a couple of minutes to get the shot I needed. So I changed all the settings to underexpose it and increase the contrast. The image itself was taken in color but by taking it in RAW when I got home, I could just remove the colour from it, and then I had my black and white image. Okay, and the same yeah. is same is true as if you take um, an image in black and white in RAW, you can actually then convert it to colour afterwards. Where if you take a black and white image as a JPEG, you can't convert it to a colour image afterwards. Okay. And Kathy uh, asked, do you ever shoot uh, live action? Um, in terms of videos or with my live view on the camera? I'm, I'm going to assume that she, she's, she's meaning uh, video, yeah, I'm gonna, unless she uh, um, I do. corrects me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this year I have actually started to do um, quite a bit more video as well, but stills are still my main area that I focus on. Is that, um, but is certainly that with the any, dippers. Any challenges on the video, on the video side? Uh, um, it has because, obviously, um, with the video, and doing it through an SLR camera, if your subject moves around a lot, um, it does come in and out of focus. So I, I have had a few challenges with that, um, particularly with my dippers, as I've actually videoed some of the behaviours um, in the stream as well, and that was a challenge, trying to keep the bird actually in focus as it moved around. Yeah, one more question from, from Lay, Lee, uh, Lay, sorry. Uh, when you go out and shoot, do you have a plan of which animal you will shoot that day? Or do you go out and look for any animal, then stay with it? And do you have any favourite websites that give you information about, you know, habits, lifestyles of the animals that you're that you're actually going to photograph? Um, it's actually a bit of both. Um, so with with the Dipper, I was going out every day to photograph just that bird, no others. Uh, but sometimes I will also go out and just see what animals I can find. Um, when I go down to do my insect work, I don't know what insects I'm going to find when I go out, so 
I'll go out, and once I find an insect, I'll stay with it for an hour, a couple of hours, maybe more, before I move on to something else. Okay, and sorry, one more, one more question from Martin. Um, he's, uh, this has been asked, but he said, how does Victoria handle white balance? Because the shots are perfect, hence the question. Um, well, actually, depending on, generally speaking, my camera's actually set to cloudy white balance, um, because I find it really helps to bring out warmth in colours. It doesn't really matter so much with the black and white. Um, but, I mean, it's one thing, I think, where digital does help. Uh, I actually learned on a 35mm camera, so I learned to get everything right there and then, because I only had one chance to get it right. right. But with digital, you can change things, have a look at the background. If you don't like it, you can tweak things, change the white balance, change the exposure, and take it again. Okay, fantastic. I think that's, that addresses most of the questions. Brilliant. We've got uh, now a category where we're talk, you're going to talk about mammals. I am, yep. I'm going to move on to some mammals and some very well-known mammals. That hopefully yeah, I'll leave you to that, yeah. Enjoy. Right. Okay, so we are going to move on to mammals now. And this first image is not only one of my favourite images, but one of my most rewarding of an otter on the sunset levels. This is the only image I actually have from four days of sitting in bushes waiting for the otter to make an appearance. Now, I will say at this point, I did actually go home during the evening. I didn't sit there all night. Now, initially, I had help in locating its favorite sleeping spot and then set myself up before it would come up to sleep during the day. And I would stay there until it had gone again. For the first couple of days, I didn't actually take a single shot as I wanted to make sure I wasn't causing any stress. And when I was sure it was not bothered by my presence, then the camera came out of the bag. Now, a lot of otter pictures are taken of them in the water, and again I wanted something different, and I wasn't to be disappointed. On the fourth day of sitting in my bush, some walkers passed close by, waking the young otter, where it looked straight at me, from where, straight, where it looked straight towards where I was sitting. Now just as it did so, the sunrise produced this most wonderful and warm glow over its back, and the branches that it was sleeping underneath. To have such a wonderful moment with such an elusive animal was incredible. And shortly after the walkers passed by, it went back to sleep for around four hours. Now it shows that researching your animal and its habitat, and also perseverance, really can pay off with an incredibly rewarding moment with a normally shy and elusive animal in this case. And believe it or not, this image was actually taken with a 100mm macro lens with just from a few feet away, and it's actually not been cropped at all. Now this next image is of a slightly more typical photo of an otter. Um, and I say slightly more typ typical because it's actually sitting in, the, in amongst seaweed on the coast. But with this shot, I aim to show a calm moment of the otter in its habitat, and did this by composing the image with the otter in the bottom left-hand corner, taking up just a quarter of the shot with the remaining three quarters left for the shimmering seaweed and water behind. Now, I actually came across this otter completely by chance whilst walking along the coast looking for seals. But as I saw it walking towards me, I actually crouched down and just waited. And I have to admit, I was a little surprised when it walked right across the front of my feet, went a few more paces, and then laid down in the seaweed. Now, I used an aperture of 5.6 here for the otter and the foreground, so that everything on the same plane would be in focus giving a depth to the image whilst throwing out the background, creating a bokeh with the, lighting, with the light shining on the seaweed behind. And this is another of my taking from behind images, a method that I'm increasingly using to show a different angle of my subject. A little more action and drama in. Um, I don't always just take uh, portrait images. I do do the action shots as well. And this is actually two red deer stags fighting during the annual rut. Now certainly for the red deer, you need to be looking at visiting early morning or late afternoon, as this is when most of the action takes place. Now this was actually taken early morning, and although it was fairly clear when I arrived, the mist quickly moved in, casting a veil over most of the rutting green. But luckily, these two younger stags were battling it out at the edge of the main green near the forest right in front of me. But I will say here, there was actually a fence between me and the deer. The one thing the mist did create was a real atmosphere to the moment by almost creating noise for me. To, to enhance this, I used black and white with a medium contrast, but did under expose to add even more drama and darkness to the image, and took the image more or less at eye level. 
and this is one of the few images where I have done a bit of post-processing on, but all I've done to it is actually add more noise to it to add a little bit more to the actual image itself. Now we have another of a red deer stag, but this is one image I tend to use a lot to illustrate the idea of focusing on the nearest eye, which is a common rule used by many wildlife photographers. But what if you can't see the eyes? What do you focus on then? To create captivating images, your subject does not need to be looking at you. Yes, eye contact is very powerful, but what about taking images where you're seeing more or less what your subject is seeing? And this was taken during the rut from a car. And this stag had just uh, won a fight and chased off another stag from his patch. I was actually looking out over the green, and it was this moment I wanted to capture. Showing off his powerful frame and antlers, but also showing a moment of calm and contemplation after a battle. You see so many images of the battles and roaring stags, and I have numerous images myself, but rarely do you see the moments captured immediately afterwards, the more reflective times. Now, if you are going to photograph a particular wildlife event, such as the red deer rat, don't just concentrate on the main action. Look at what's happening around the main event, as well as the goings on before and afterwards. Remember, with mating events, there's so much more to them than just the fighting for dominance. These two images are again from a particular wildlife event, but pupping a mating season for the grey seals around the coast of the UK, but two very different images. So this image is of two younger seals, a male and a female, that did actually not breed this particular year, but they were tussling in the water's edge. And I actually took several images of them in various positions, positions, but this remains my favourite from the encounter as it makes me smile every time I see it, and I've actually called it Seal of Love. Now I don't normally project human feelings and emotions onto my subjects, but they do look like a young couple in love, and this is an image where I wanted to bring out the stillness of the moment and the feeling of the bond between the two seals. So back to my black and white with a soft con contrast and slightly softer focus this time while completely overexposing to white out the, black, the background behind bringing focus to the two seals and the watery reflections in the sand. And this is a, another seal. This is actually a grey seal bull, um, pretty much the beach master of this particular area. Um, it was taken on a, a bright day with warm colours, but I did still want to keep an element of fun into the image. Now this was by far one of the real beach masters, and you can see the battle scars on his nose. To make the most of the moment, I got right down onto the beach, so I was eye level with the seal, and decided on a slightly comical shot, where it appears as he's coming into the shot to investigate what's going on. I really wanted to show off the wonderful colours and texture of their fur when it's dry, and almost contrast it with the pebbles on the beach, and created a depth to the image by using a wide aperture focused on the seal's eye, so only that plane of the image was in focus, with everything in the front and behind being softer. The seals themselves are very charismatic animals and wonderful photographic subjects. However, they can also be unpredictable, particularly during the mating season. So if you are thinking of photographing them, I would check out the area fully and also the animals in the area, as I have found that seals in one part of the country can act slightly different to the seals in another part of the country. Now, we're actually going to move away from UK wildlife and come to a series of images that I took during a trip to Madagascar. Now this is a wonderful place, but one that actually has its own photographic obstacles, including very strong light, um, which can create high contrast levels. Now all the images you're going to see here are of lemurs, but taking, taken in varying habitats and conditions. This first very warm and rich in colour image is of a ringtail lemur in the southern part of the country, where the ground is predominantly red sand, which gives the lemurs themselves a bit of an orange tinge to their fur. Now, this is a very early morning shot, taken around sunrise to make the most of the warm hues at that time of the morning, which really bring out the reds and the oranges. I came across this individual sitting, looking towards the sunrise, that was picking up the whites in its front. I was looking for something slightly different and thought-provoking, and you can almost feel the lemur thinking about the day ahead, but almost has an element of sadness to its face, which I captured enhanced by underexposing image, which has also added a little bit more warmth. Now one trick for really bringing warmth to your images, um, especially for digital, as I said, is to use a cloudy or even a shady white balance instead of daylight, even on a bright sunny day, because it really will bring out the warmth of the colours. And this particular image is actually taken with a shady white balance. 
So that's like my image here. And I can honestly say that I don't think monochrome is used enough in wildlife photography. We see it all the time in portrait and landscape photography, but rarely with wildlife. And it's such a great medium for bringing out all those tiny details that are overlooked with colour, such as different shapes. And that is why I've used black and white for this image of an injury feeding high up in the trees on a rather cloudy and occasionally rainy day. The light was just enough to not only add highlights around the face to show the bulbous shape of the eyes and their wonderful big fluffy ears, but also show off the shading and texture of the black and white fur over the whole lemur. And the softer light adds something to the leaves as a soft illumination to complete the image to show how at home these large lemurs are up in the treetops. Now this is another lemur and it's one that very little is actually known about. It's actually fo only found in one small fragment of forest and it's called the Zombitsi sportive lemur. And they have their favourite daytime roost which they can normally be found in as is the case for this particular individual. The day itself was overcast with only brief moments of brightness reaching under the canopy of the trees. When it did come through it really lit up the eyes of this lemur and in you capturing that moment wouldn't be easy and there were a few failed attempts. But this is why having some idea of an, of an image can really help you prepare all the settings on your camera ready for a brief moment you have to take a picture. Now I actually prepared my camera here, I focused on the eye using a cloudy, cloudy white balance to add warmth and drop the exposure to really darken the rest of the image, leaving just the eye, part of the nose and small patches of fur to be highlighted by the sun. Now just as the sun came through the canopy, the lemur looked up towards the light. It's a very dark image, image but these are, image, these are creatures of the night and forest and I wanted to add this aspect to the image even though it was taken during the day. So back to our black and white again, and this is an extreme close-up of a uh, diademed Sofarka's face. Now this is a beautifully coloured um, lemur with stunning deep orangey red eyes, which are totally mesmerising, but as a result you don't really see the detail of the face. This particular individual was quite an old male, and as such I was looking for an image that would really show that, so I opted to remove the colour and really focus on the details of his face, all the lines and tiny hairs that would be overlooked with the colour. Now I've actually metered the image for the dark part of his face around his eyes and his nose which has resulted in a white ring of fur around his face and this actually gives a real wizened wise old man appearance and really draws you to his eyes. Now this is actually the same Safarka as the previous image but this time in colour and on a very different angle. During my time on Madagascar, I wanted to come away with images that would give a real sense of not only the characters of each of the species, but just how vulnerable they are. And for this particular image, I also wanted to show the hands, as they're really not that different from our own. So I've composed the image such that the hands and feet holding onto the tree are in focus, with the face looking to one side, just visible, um, almost fading into the forest. Now I opted for colour for this image to illustrate the fur and also bring out the beautiful orangey red eye despite not being in focus. Now I'm actually a scientist um, and conservation biologist first and foremost and always try to use these skills when photographing wildlife to add a different perspective to make people think and question my images but images that can tell a story on their own as this is what will create a really uh, remarkable and long-lasting impression. So I've got another nighttime lemur here. This is actually a white-footed sportive lemur, again in its daytime roost of the spiny trees. Now I'm often exploring new ways of photographing animals using what is around them at the time and here I use the maze of spiny trees to create a frame around the lemur through which it's looking to almost create a window into his little world. Now I actually used a daylight white balance here to even out and soften the colours. So wildlife is a wonderful thing. It will show you beauty, battles, calmness and humour as we have here. For me, wildlife photography is about capturing a moment that will bring back memories and stories of that day or trip. Memories you can share with family and friends. Now all of my images, with the exception of identification shots, have a story and one that I don't really need to write down because they're in me and this is one thing that will really help you to capture those unique moments. Now this particular image, um, we actually came across as Safarka dozing away, hugging on, hugging very tightly to a tree. And for me, it just, it makes me smile every time I look at it. 
because it actually looks as if he slipped down the tree and is now holding on for dear life, not really sure of what's just happened. But I'll let you make your own mind up, but don't forget to capture those funny moments when you're out and about. Now this is actually the end of the mammal section, um, so I don't know if we have any questions before I briefly mention silhouette. Yeah, we've we've got a little bit, of, uh, a couple of questions here, and we've got we haven't got a long, long to go for the webinar, so I'll quickly address those. We've got a question from Ruth who says, "How do you use your images for conservation?" She was she's a uh, primatologist for many years before turning to media, and she's just wondering how how you use your imagery for conservation. Um, some of my images have actually gone out uh, to Madagascar to help them, kind of really show different ways of capturing the images, um, like different ways that people can actually view the animals as well. So I've actually sent them to uh, travel companies in Madagascar to use um, for that. And also I've done some work with um, for my local wildlife trust as well to really kind of bring to the foreground why some animals are so important to particular habitats and why habitats are important to those particular animals. Yeah, I think we, we featured an article on the, on the Manfrotto site about your work for your local wildlife trust. So yeah, that, that's excellent. Um, we've got um, a question from Bodil in Norway. It says, uh, do you use only manual mode or shutter aperture priority mode? Uh, most of the photos are actually taken with aperture priority mode. OK. And Randall asks, uh, do you use reflector cards for the um, insect work that you showed previously? Uh, no, I don't. I literally. Um, I actually very rarely use flash for them, but if I do use flash for my insects, it tends to be in a very creative way, so the flash will be quite away from the insect itself, just to add light from a particular direction. Okay, and Sundar asks, uh, for, the, for the mammal shots, what metering mode we're using, uh, spot or other? Uh, most of it's spot more, metering. So. Uh, okay. Spot metering I'll use more. Yeah. yeah. and. Um, how far away were you from from the from the seals that you the the, the um, seals of love shot that you took? Um, that's actually taken with a 400 mil zoom lens. Okay, so oh, great, quite you, away. Yeah, that just give you a bit more time, give you the rest of the time just to uh, cover the silhouettes then. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. So. I'm actually going to move away from what we would probably consider as conventional wildlife images now, and just briefly about um, silhouettes. So what is a silhouette? A silhouette is an image where the subject is, is represented by a usually featureless solid color against a light background, normally with the exposure set for the background. Now, Typically most silhouettes are actually taken at sunrise or sunset, but you can actually use um, just normal daylight to create a very striking silhouette. Now this first image is one that was actually more of an opportunistic shot than a setup shot, and it was taken during a rather cloudy and wet day up in the rainforest. The plan was for the flash to go off, light up the Milne Edwards Safarka, showing its beautiful colours, but it didn't, for whatever reason, and I was left with what I believe to be a much more powerful image, as it's actually silhouetted against the sky, with the lack of colour and detail in the lima, um, really making you focus on the powerfulness and the shape of it. Now we've got an, another silhouette here, and this is a black and white silhouette, and these are actually mating dung flies, and again, taken during the day, but on what was a very bright, bright blue sky day. And you can still silhouette in these conditions. I found this pair of flies on a rather knobbly branch and noticed that they were actually blowing bubbles. And although I have this image in both colour and as this particular silhouette, I definitely prefer this image over the colour one. I took it from just below the flies to make sure that the background was completely clear of any branches and used an aperture of F9 to bring all the little details of the bubbles and hairs into focus. A straightforward black silhouette against a white background draws the eye in and is an incredibly dominant shot, but for them to work you must have a completely white background. This is a very rare silhouette of a bird taken at sunset but it's rare for me to take these kinds of shots anyway. As most of the wildlife silhouettes that you will actually see tend to be birds or even deer taken at dawn or dusk. Now this was a case of being in the right time, at right place at the right time, as uh, the oyster catcher looked out to sea from the rocks. Now if I am going to do a bird at sunset, 
I'll actually try to create a little try to capture a little bit of glow to my subject, particularly around the edges, as it just gives it a little more depth and warmth. Um, and if you do want to bring out some extra warmth, as I said, you can actually just change to a cloudy or a shady white balance, which will also add a little bit more orangey red there to, to it as well. Now, just a couple of quick tips on silhouettes. If you do want to create a really great silhouette that will stand out, there are a few things to take into consideration. Always focus on the subject and not the background, as this will make um, your subject more prominent. And if you're going to shoot at sunrise or sunset, it's always a good idea to check out your subject, or um, if it is wildlife, to check out the area beforehand, just so you know where you're going. And also look out for the more unusual shots. So don't necessarily always look for the birds and the, the deer. Maybe have a look at insects. And I always find that using natural light actually creates something that's slightly more powerful than if you use artificial lights. Now, I think a little bit different. This is my last slide, and it is actually classified as a reverse silhouette. Now, regular silhouettes are normally a dark image against a light background, whereas reverse silhouettes, you have a light subject against a dark background. And this is illustrated here with this one. This was actually taken early morning on a lake, and it's something I'm just starting to investigate. I'm unsure as to whether it's actually a more authoritative image than a regular silhouette. But one thing I've found is that they're actually certainly more technically difficult to pull off, as you still don't want too much, if any, detail in the main subject, but you still need to make sure it has a crisp background um, against its backdrop. Sorry, a crisp outline against its backdrop. Now, as you can see here, there is a little bit of detail in this one, but in terms of the black around the bill, but it's actually the same shade as the background. So far, I've only tried out this technique on swans as they're perfect subjects for being white, but it's something I'm going to pursue as it seems very few people have tried this type of silhouette. And it's always important to make sure you do take into consideration the composition of your subject as well as the technique if you want to produce that truly remarkable image. Thank you very much, Victoria. Uh, that's, uh so some, you know, fantastic webinar and, and some really stunning images. And you know, based on the number of questions we've had, it's, it's obviously everybody's enjoyed it. And I want to thank everybody for joining the webinar today and, and sending their questions through to Victoria. Um, uh, just to say that uh, this is the final UK UK local hero webinar of the year. Um, uh, the next one will be Steve Gosling, landscape photographer. We'll do another webinar uh, called Floral Art, Creative Flower and Plant Photography, and that will be on the 31st of January, uh, 4 to 5 p.m. So join us for that. And uh, again, thanks very much for joining us. And uh, a little bit early to say, but uh, have, a, have, a, have a great Christmas from, from us in the UK, local heroes. Thank you and bye. <laughs>